Chapter 5, Part 2 of What Men Live By. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. What Men Live By by Leo Tolstoy, translated by L. and A. Maud. Chapter 5 How Much Land Does a Man Need? Part 2. Pahom inquired how to get to the place, and as soon as the tradesman had left him, he prepared to go there himself. He left his wife to look after the homestead, and started on his journey, taking his men with him. They stopped at a town on their way and bought a case of tea, some wine, and other presents as the tradesman had advised. On and on they went until they had gone more than three hundred miles, and on the seventh day they came to a place where the Bashkirs had pitched their tents. It was all just as the tradesmen had said. The people lived on the steps by a river in felt-covered tents. They neither tilled the ground nor ate bread. Their cattle and horses grazed in herds on the steppe. The colts were tethered behind the tents, and the mares were driven to them twice a day. The mares were milked, and from the milk kumis was made. It was the women who prepared kumis, and they also made cheese. As far as the men were concerned, drinking kumis and tea, eating mutton, and playing on their pipes was all they cared about. They were all stout and merry, and all the summer long they never thought of doing any work. They were quite ignorant and knew no Russian, but were good-natured enough. As soon as they saw Pahom, they came out of their tents and gathered round their visitor. An interpreter was found, and Pahom told them he had come about some land. The Bashkirs seemed very glad. They took Pahom and led him into one of the best tents, where they made him sit on some down cushions placed on a carpet, while they sat round him. They gave him tea and kumis, and had a sheep killed, and gave him mutton to eat. Pahom took presents out of his cart, and distributed them among the Bashkirs, and divided amongst them the tea. The Bashkirs were delighted. They talked a great deal among themselves, and then told the interpreter to translate. "'They wish to tell you,' said the interpreter, "'that they like you, and that it is our custom to do all we can to please a guest, and to repay him for his gifts. You have given us presents. Now tell us which of the things we possess please you best, that we may present them to you.' What pleases me best here, answered Pahom, is your land. Our land is crowded, and the soil is exhausted, but you have plenty of land, and it is good land. I never saw the like of it. The interpreter translated the Bashkirs talked among themselves for a while. Pahom could not understand what they were saying, but saw that they were much amused, and that they shouted and laughed. Then they were silent and looked at Pahom while the interpreter said, they wish me to tell you that in return for your presence they will gladly give you as much land as you want. You have only to point it out with your hand, and it is yours. The Bashkirs talked again for a while and began to dispute. Pahom asked what they were disputing about, and the interpreter told him that some of them thought they ought to ask their chief about the land and not act in his absence, while others thought there was no need to wait for his return. While the Bashkirs were disputing, a man in a large fox fur cap appeared on the scene. They all became silent and rose to their feet. The interpreter said, This is our chief himself. Pahom immediately fetched the best dressing gown and five pounds of tea and offered these to the chief. The chief accepted them and seated himself in the place of honor. The Bashkirs at once began telling him something. The chief listened for a while then made a sign with his head for them to be silent, and addressing himself to Pahom said in Russian, Well, let it be so. Choose whatever piece of land you like. We have plenty of it. How can I take as much as I like, thought Pahom. I must get a deed to make it secure, or else they may say it is yours and afterward may take it away again. Thank you for your kind words, he said aloud. You have much land, and I only want a little, but I should like to be sure which bit is mine. 
could it not be measured and made over to me life and death are in god's hands you good people give it to me but your children might wish to take it away again you are quite right said the chief we will make it over to you i heard that a dealer had been here continued pahom and that you gave him a little land too and signed title deeds to that effect i should like to have it done in the same way the chief understood yes replied he that can be done quite easily we have a scribe and we will go to town with you and have the deed properly sealed and what will be the price asked pahom our price is always the same one thousand roubles a day pahom did not understand uh, a day what measure is that how many acres would that be we do not know how to reckon it out said the chief we sell it by the day as much as you can go round on your feet in a day is yours and the price is one thousand roubles a day pahom was surprised but in a day you can get round a large tract of land he said the chief laughed it will be all yours said he but there is one condition if you don't return on the same day to the spot whence you started your money is lost but how am i to mark the way that i have gone why we shall go to any spot you like and stay there you must start from that spot and make your round taking a spade with you wherever you think necessary make a mark at every turning dig a hole and pile up the turf then afterwards we will go round with a plough from hole to hole you may make as large a circuit as you please but before the sun sets you must return to the place you started from all the land you cover will be yours pahov was delighted it was decided to start early next morning they talked a while and after drinking some more kumis and eating some more mutton they had tea again and then the night came on they gave pahom a feather bed to sleep on and the bashkirs dispensed for the night promising to assemble the next morning at daybreak and ride out before sunrise to the appointed spot pahom lay on the feather bed but could not sleep he kept thinking about the land what a large tract i will mark off thought he i can easily go thirty-five miles in a day the days are long now and within a circuit of thirty-five miles what a lot of land there will be i will sell the poorer land and let it go to peasants but i'll pick out the best and farm it i will buy two ox teams and hire two more laborers about a hundred and fifty acres shall be plough land and i will pasture cattle on the rest pahom lay awake all night and dozed off only just before dawn hardly were his eyes closed when he had a dream he thought he was lying in that same tent and heard somebody chuckling outside he wondered who it could be and rose and went out and he saw the bashkir chief sitting in front of the tent holding his side and rolling about with laughter going nearer to the chief pahom asked what are you laughing at but he saw that it was no longer the chief but the dealer who had recently stopped at his house and had told him about the land just as pahom was going to ask have you been here long he saw that it was not the dealer but the peasant who had come up from the volga long ago to pahom's old home then he saw that it was not the peasant either but the devil himself with hoofs and horns sitting there and chuckling and before him lay a man barefoot prostrate on the ground with only trousers and shirt on and pahom dreamed that he looked more attentively to see what sort of a man it was lying there and he saw that the man was dead and that it was himself he awoke horror struck what things one does dream thought he looking round he saw through the open door that the dawn was breaking it's time to wake them up thought he we ought to be starting he got up roused his man was sleeping in his cart bade him harness and went to call the bashkirs it's time to go to the steppe to measure the land he said the bashkirs rose and assembled and the chief came too then they began drinking kumis again and offered pahom some tea but he would not wait if we are to go let us go it is high time said he 
The Bashkis got ready, and they all started, some mounted on horses and some in carts. Pahom drove in his own small cart with his servant and took a spade with him. When they reached the steppe, the morning red was beginning to kindle. They ascended a hillock, called by the Bashkirs a Shikhan, and, dismounting from their carts and their horses gathered in one spot, the chief came up to Pahom and stretched out his arm towards the plain. See, said he, all this as far as your eye can reach is ours. You may have any part of it you like. Pahom's eyes glistened. It was all virgin soil, as flat as the palm of your hand, as black as the seed of a poppy, and in the hollows different kinds of grasses grew breast high. The chief took off his fox fur cap, placed it on the ground, and said, This will be the mark. Start from here and return here again. All the land you go round shall be yours. Pahom took out his money and put it on the cap. Then he took off his outer coat, remaining in his sleeveless undercoat. He unfastened his girdle and tied it tight below his stomach, put a little bag of bread into the breast of his coat, and tying a flask of water to his girdle, he drew up the tops of his boots, took the spade from his man, and stood ready to start. He considered for some moments which way he had better go. It was tempting everywhere. No matter, he concluded, I will go towards the rising sun. He turned his face to the east, stretched himself, and waited for the sun to appear above the rim. I must lose no time, he thought, and it is easier walking while it is still cool. The sun's rays had hardly flashed above the horizon before Pahom, carrying the spade over his shoulder, went down into the steppe. Pahom started walking neither slowly nor quickly. After having gone a thousand yards, he stopped, dug a hole, and placed pieces of turf one on another to make it more visible. Then he went on, and now that he had walked off his stiffness, he quickened his pace. After a while, he dug another hole. Pahom looked back. The hillock could be distinctly seen in the sunlight, with the people on it, and the glittering tires of the cartwheels. At a rough guess, Pahom concluded that he had walked three miles. It was growing warmer. He took off his undercoat, flung it across his shoulder, and went on again. It had grown quite warm now. He looked at the sun. It was time to think of breakfast. The first shift is done, but there are four in a day, and it is too soon yet to turn. But I will just take off my boots, said he to himself. He sat down, took off his boots, stuck them into his girdle, and went on. It was easy walking now. I will go on for another three miles, thought he, and then turned to the left. The spot is so fine that it would be a pity to lose it. The further one goes, the better the land seems. He went straight on for a while, and when he looked round, the hillock was scarcely visible, and the people on it looked like black ants, and he could just see something glistening there in the sun. Ah, thought Pahom, I have gone far enough in this direction, it is time to turn. Besides, I am in a regular sweat, and very thirsty. He stopped, dug a large hole, and heaped up pieces of turf. Next he untied his flask, had a drink, and then turned sharply to the left. He went on and on, the grass was high, and it was very hot. Pahom began to grow tired. He looked at the sun, and he saw that it was noon. Well, he thought, I must have a rest. He sat down and ate some bread and drank some water, but he did not lie down, thinking that if he did he might fall asleep. After sitting a little while he went on again. At first he walked easily. The food had strengthened him, but it had become terribly hot and he felt sleepy. Still he went on thinking, an hour to suffer, a lifetime to live. He went a long way in this direction also, and was about to turn to the left again, when he perceived a damp hollow. It would be a pity to leave that out, he thought. Flax would do well there. So he went on past the hollow, and dug a hole on the other side of it before he turned the corner. Pahom looked towards the hillock. The heat made the air hazy. It seemed to be quivering, and through the haze the people on the hillock could scarcely be seen. 
Ah, thought Pahom, I have made the sides too long. I must make this one shorter. And he went along the third side, stepping faster. He looked at the sun. It was nearly halfway to the horizon, and he had not yet gone two miles of the third side of the square. He was still ten miles from the goal. No, he thought. Though it will make my land lopsided, I must hurry back in a straight line now. I might go too far, and, as it is, I have great deal of land. So Pahom hurriedly dug a hole and turned straight toward the hillock. Pahom went straight towards the hillock, but he now walked with difficulty. He was done up with the heat, his bare feet were cut and bruised, and his legs began to fail. He longed to rest, but it was impossible if he meant to get back before sunset. The sun waits for no man, and it was sinking lower and lower. Oh, dear, he thought, if only I have not blundered trying for too much. What if I am too late? He looked over the hillock and at the sun. He was still far from his goal, and the sun was already near the rim. A home walked on and on. It was very hard walking, but he went quicker and quicker. He pressed on, but was still far from the place. He began running, threw away his coat, his boots, his flask, and his cap, and kept only the spade which he used as a support. What shall I do? he thought again. I have grasped too much, and ruined the whole affair. I can't get there before the sun sets. And this fear made him still more breathless. Pahom went on running. His soaking shirt and trousers stuck to him, and his mouth was parched. His breast was working like a blacksmith's bellows. His heart was beating like a hammer, and his legs were giving way as if they did not belong to him. Pahom was seized with terror lest he should die of the strain. Though afraid of death, he could not stop. After having run all that way, they will call me a fool if I stop now, thought he. And he ran on and on, and drew near and heard the Bashkirs yelling and shouting to him, and their cries inflamed his heart still more. He gathered his last strength and ran on. The sun was close to the rim, and cloaked in mist looked large and red as blood. Now, yes, now, it was about to set. The sun was quite low, but he was also quite near his aim. Pahom could already see the people on the hillock waving their arms to hurry him up. He could see the fox fur cap on the ground and the money on it, and the chief sitting on the ground holding his sides. And Pahom remembered his dream. There is plenty of land, thought he, but will God let me live on it? I have lost my life, I have lost my life, I shall never reach that spot. Pahom looked at the sun, which had reached the earth. One side of it had already disappeared. With all his remaining strength he rushed on, bending his body forward so his legs could hardly follow fast enough to keep him from falling. Just as he reached the hillock it suddenly grew dark. He looked up, the sun had already set. He gave a cry. All my labor has been in vain, thought he, and was about to stop, but he heard the Bashkir still shouting and remembered that though to him, from below, the sun seemed to have set, they on the hillock could still see it. He took a long breath and ran up the hillock. It was still light there. He reached the top and saw the cap. Before it sat the chief laughing and holding his sides. Again Pahom remembered his dream, and he uttered a cry. His legs gave way beneath him. He fell forward and reached the cap with his hands. "'Ah! What a fine fellow!' exclaimed the chief. "'He has gained much land!' Pahom's servant came running up and tried to raise him, but he saw that blood was flowing from his mouth. Pahom was dead. The Bashkirs clicked their tongues to show their pity. His servant picked up the spade and dug a grave long enough for Pahom to lie in, and buried him in it. Six feet from his head to his heels was all he needed. End of chapter 5 End of What Men Live by by Leo Tolstoy Translated by L. and A. Maud